Hello everyone, and welcome to Season 2 of Differential Diagnosis, the podcast where we continue to talk about every episode of House Ever Made, among anything else that we can think of house-related. My name's Harvey, and I'll be your host for this new season, and replacing Gaz for this year's season is a very similar-sounding man, also called Gaz. Hey, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, Obviously, Harvey is trying to make some sort of joke at my expense. (laughs) I do like to try. Happy New Year to Harvey, obviously. Yeah. Um, Did you have a good holiday, Gaz? I mean, obviously, I've spoken to you during the holiday, but just for the audience's sake. Well, I'm glad you asked. I had a splendid holiday. That's what you're supposed to say. Um, But as, as it is one of all Christmases... They're basically the same. And then you do the celebration and then there's just like a vast space of nothingness that happens into, until New Year's. And then really the only, the best place to be to celebrate New Year's is really to be on a plane. As you were, because you went on holiday. I did. I totally skipped the family thing this year. Me and my partner just went to Vegas and it was fantastic. I don't think I'll ever spend time with my family again. Oh, this is such a... A buoyant and pleasant Christmas for all. <laughs> yeah, so family filled. <laughs> but um, but yeah, we're we're back. We did it. We did season one. We finished it. We didn't give up and decide it was a horrible experience. It was actually a very nice experience, and hopefully, it will continue to be a nice experience for anyone listening to it. Yeah, yeah, we've got a lot more house to get through, but we're one eighth of the way through, and that's oh all that matters. Oh, Keep God. your eye on the prize. <laughs> the eye on the prize. <laughs> what is the prize? What is what is the end of this? What does it even mean? Not having to do this anymore, but with a wow. sense of completion. Wow. I don't think, even, even for myself, I don't think the deferred gratification of completing this <laughs> is ever going <laughs> to match <laughs> or supersede <laughs> the suffering yeah. I go through every hour that I do this podcast. <laughs> Um, y- yeah, you know, we're not quitters. We don't get halfway through something or an eighth of the way through something and just say, <laughs> tools down, we don't care. Mm. I mean, some people in life are like that, but we're not. And that's what counts. It's going to look really bad when we quit this in like season three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I am. That statement is going to age very badly. I hope it sticks to me like glue. <laughs> Well, um, well, this uh, this week, um, just to kick things off, we're going to be talking about the season premiere of House MD season two, which is called Acceptance, guest starring LL Cool J as the uh, as the death row inmate Clarence. Very exciting stuff. I think there's. I was looking around, and there wasn't like. There's not like a hugely interesting history to season two. It's pretty much got the same showrunner, a couple of new writers, a lot of the old writers, and just a bigger budget. There's, um, from what I could tell, there wasn't really a lot of interesting background, but it just seems like kind of the template's been set in stone now. And I think most people might agree, even though season one is really good, that this is kind of where the show really finds its feet and stays in a really good stride for several seasons. Uh, would you agree, Gaz, or have you found something absolutely crazy? The hair and makeup is better, I guess. Um. <laughs> it, it, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's like a small point, but I think everything's generally better. Like the camera works better, the the show is more colourful. It's clearly got a higher budget. Um, it's got a lot more energy to it as well. But I think that's just everyone kind of now in the groove, and probably after season one, like having a bit of a reset and really rethinking what the strengths of season one were. But um, I think season two is popularly considered possibly the best season by a lot of people. I know some people have problems with season three and like um, the Tritter arc and things like that. And then the the team leaving. So I think season two is like considered like probably the best one. Mm. Um, I don't agree, um, but I'd say it's definitely up there. It's one of the greats. Yeah. Um, from what I can tell, I mean... Just the overall kind of feel of the season is just of a higher quality. Um, mm. LL Cool J, notwithstanding, in this this episode, um, that where it feels like we're 
Um, there's not so much of a, in terms of the characterization, there's not so much of a sea change in anything. It just feels like you're just revisiting old friends. But when you look at the actual production values of the season, it's much better. And like you say, they've obviously evaluated uh, some of the elements relating to the production. You don't see all the kind of, ov- it's not too OTT on the animation stuff anymore. Yes. It's much more theatrical um, in how it shows medical um, phenomenon, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There, There is one small, there's two small CGI bits in this um in this episode but i do think that they're higher quality cgi which is good um and on top of that uh yes the show uh, introduces its uh its its medical problem with a hallucination and actually acting out a scene rather than cgi so it definitely it, it's a very small point and it's probably not even worth stating that a season two is better than season one in terms of production but it's very noticeable um especially when you go from season one straight to season two without a big gap yeah um i mean for us we've gone we've had a big gap because of just the time between uh, oh yeah but not like not like a year like you would if you're watching the show on telly yeah that's true um and i would say it's going to be interesting seeing how this all plays out i mean it get it feels like no time is really time has not elapsed since the first the season finale in this first episode of this season because house the main reason you can tell is because house is still struggling with stacy's presence on the scene they're still trying to establish their relationship in it which um i agree is interesting because most seasons would have a year break in the amount of time that the show takes to get to the next season but House seems to do it the other way around. Lots of time passes within the season and then known time passes between seasons. Yes. Which is an interesting thing because some people would see, um, especially in writing, sometimes you want time to pass so that you can then explain new plot points that happen between like the season finale cliffhanger and time afterwards for a dramatic effect. But yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm really interested to see how this all goes. Um, I have to be as vague as that. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's I, th- I think the really big thing that we're probably both eager to explore is the Stacy and House relationship, which was set up at the end of season one, and um, that's pretty much the only House demon in the closet that we're still the skeleton in the closet that we're still waiting to come out. We kind of know the context of everything. We know a lot of the context of the characters, but. Hopefully there's more to discover, but I think the Stacy and House thing is going to be the the Vogler of this season <laughs> that's going to hold it all together. Not actually that Vogler did hold together last season. No, he Vogler did not. Vogler was sort of an antagonist, but let's consider the Stacy relationship an antagonist for this season. Not even the characters. It's the relationship that's the antagonist. Yeah. It's actually a, it's a concept. It's a possibility that's the antagonist, not even a character, which is terrifying. Uh, totally. anyway. And what, what's weirder about this one is that we're getting into it at the start. So unless the Stacy thing goes for the whole season, it's going to it's not going to be like Vogler where he kind of breaks up the season. We're kind of going to kick off with Stacy with something new. And then once the Stacy arc is resolved, it's like we're going to go back to kind of standard house as he was in season one. So it's an interesting way of doing it. OK. But but we'll see we'll see how that affects the season as we go. Anyway, I'm 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 just excited. There's a whole <laughs> new season, lot to talk about. Fantastic. I know you want to get onto the plot synopsis so we can get rolling. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, boys, this is it. Um, as <laughs> always, um, this synopsis is powered by house.fandom.com. Uh, the the veritable hitchhiker's guide to house md um (laughs) and uh so here is the synopsis uh written by someone i don't know who um thank you uh want to appreciate you um so acceptance is the premiere episode of the second season of house which first aired on september 13th 2005 
When a death row inmate takes ill, House tricks Stacy into getting him released to the hospital so he can figure out what is wrong with him. When the prisoner improves, Cuddy tries to get rid of him, only to have more serious symptoms appear. Meanwhile, Cameron deals with a clinic patient's terminal diagnosis by trying to prove everyone wrong. And when the diagnosis seems to be confirmed at each step, she gets more and more desperate to save her patient while wondering why House only cares about a murderer. Well, that sounds uh, that sounds pretty gripping. We've got we've got a Cameron plot, fantastic. We've got um we got a little more to House, a little of Stacy, and I'm sure I'm sure uh, Chase and Foreman will do some things as well, uh, like hate the patient, and then we'll find out why, and see into their souls. Ah, uh, you are wishing for way too much. <laughs> well, um, well, we've got everything out of the way. We've we've said our hellos. We've we've talked about our excitements, and we've done the plot synopsis. So I think we're we're ready to get on with the premiere of season two and the premiere of season two of Differential Diagnosis. We're going to be taking a look at House MD season two, episode one, Acceptance. So we've got we've got this death row inmate. He's he's a bit of a badass. He's being played by LL Cool J. I mean, Christ, that's such a cameo for the two thousands. Yeah, and he's he's very good. Having watched it again, yeah, I was surprised by how good he was because you know if usually when you put a musician. Into it because I remember when Justin Bieber guest starred in CSI and it was quite terrible because <laughs> he was just trying to you know increase his his career and possibly get into an acting role, trying to get into the act you know trying to become an actor or maybe have it as a backbench when the career failed when the music career failed. But um, a little cool Jay turns up you know he's out of his element but he does he does a very good job. Yeah, you know if I didn't know this was a celebrity cameo I wouldn't have thought about it. Which um, and I I kind of think this also sets off a trend with House. Like more and more patients are celebrity cameos. I don't think it gets totally out of control, but there are lots. Like Meatloaf turns up as one of them. I remember in a very very later season. Um, it's possibly a bit distracting. I don't like it, but as long as but the casting department seems to do it very well. They seem to at least have checked whether or not LL Cool J can act. <laughs> Yeah, they've done a bit of due diligence. Although, you know, Meatloaf's got some acting chops. He was in some pretty good films. Oh, like, yeah, Meat- Meatloaf's a good actor. I'm more mean in the sense that it's not even whether or not they're good. It's just the fact that while watching it, you're like, wow, that's Meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, you know. And uh, what's interesting is, like, he he's just hallucinating and he's trying to figure out He's like he's being haunted by his past crimes, mm. but it's just a bit kind of, it is a little bit like on the nose, but very conventional. Yeah, well, it's so, yeah, he, he um we sort of start off and, and there's, a, there's one inmate who's asking for his final meal and he's asking it to the warden, which it's um actually nice that the warden is an authority figure who isn't acting like a total asshole. That's usually the the standard for house he seemed they seem to be like the warden seems to be like being relatively respectful and having a proper conversation with him it kind of feels probably quite realistic to how that conversation goes i'd hold your breath harvey because he does become an asshole later on in the episode oh yes he does sorry i forget where he just like, but, uh, maybe he just likes that prisoner more maybe <laughs> I think clarence or ll cool j's character is a uh, has murdered a lot more people on the actual on death row itself so yes he might be an unpopular one but um <laughs> but yeah, so we, we kind of you know we really lets us into that world i think yeah it, it's it's an interesting setting it establishes it well and then as you say he gets let out for his like you know 
45 minutes of of like physical exercise time and then the way that we see that he's ill is that he has these series of hallucinations the four people that he's murdered kind of confront him and it absolutely terrifies him which firstly removes the cgi issue it doesn't just go into his head Mm -hmm. or his heart and show him like having a um it doesn't just go into his heart and have like his heart speeding up which is the problem his heart's pumping too fast so it's pumping air around his body instead of blood and um it also like lets us into his background it tells a little bit about him it tells it how it feels about his crimes he Mm. reacts strongly to some of the victims more than others and um you know it also shows us that he he is a killer he's killed four people and um it's quite interesting because as you watch the episode you start to like him more but it gives this kind of constant context this man has killed four people and it's um that there is an ongoing discussion throughout the episode about this like how people should be judged for their for their background and that definitely plays into the foreman story which we'll go into as the episode goes yeah um i'd say the the first thing that comes to mind is um again house is up to his old, old tricks you know terrorizing cuddy a little bit but also using cuddy as a kind of leverage to get access to um stacy which is interesting mm. um it, it's just um an interesting thing that he does one of the many tactics he uses to kind of maintain some sort of um relationship with stacy um what was really interesting is how he kind of then tries to establish trust with Stacy by using Cuddy as a kind of foil by saying, Hey, you know, do this for me. You know, we have to screw over Cuddy a little bit so you can help the patient, but maybe that's a good thing. And maybe we can establish trust over that. And then all of a sudden Stacy turns around and says, no, I had a duty to tell Cuddy. And then he's kind of left at square one again you know where he can't trust her anymore yeah well there's there's an ongoing game with with house because as you say he immediately bursts into cuddy's office happens to be while she's having a chat with stacy so it's this continuing stacy and house work together house seems to have forgiven stacy or at least be fine but he's continuing to rile up stacy but as with everything house does he's making it seem very coincidental as if like, oh, Stacy just happened to be in the office. I'm really just coming here to mess with Cuddy. And there's this continuing like element of you don't really know how he's thinking or feeling. Mm. But, it, but it doesn't feel inconsistent, which is one of the best parts of it. And then there's this sort of con- like House doesn't really have much of a storyline in this, but it's this continuing kind of, you know, House seems to be still punishing Stacy. And he 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 tricks her in order to get the patient into the hospital. He asks her to get a court order to get the man released from death row to come to the hospital and lies to her that Cuddy allowed him to do it. And then um and then as you say, and then he kind of goes back on that because Wilson has a small chat with him saying, you know, if you want Stacy to help you do stuff, then you're gonna have to get her to trust her. And then she obviously screws over house to to help Cuddy. So there's this back and forth with the characters. You know, they're kind of they're in this situation. House has said he's fine with Stacy working with her, but always there's this kind of antagonism towards her. And you wonder how much of that is just House being House or how much of that is just House really isn't over Stacy and what she's done. And yeah. um, that kind of sets up their dynamic for the episode. So it, it it's not too insane. It's not like House just being really antagonistic. It's like House being quite reasonable. But at the same time, there's this underlying toying with her that kind of you know doesn't blow its entire load in the first episode but it's kind of there and it's setting up this continuing factor of you know does house want to get back with stacy or does he just want to keep punishing her which was very much brought up in honeymoon but was seemed to be resolved in honeymoon but realistically makes sense that it's still here you don't forgive someone for something like that instantly i think the other thing to realize also uh with regards to the Cuddy and Wilson relationships with House is that they 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 get kind of used as conduits between between House and Cud and Stacy, and they kind of understand that they actually are kind of well at least Wilson is definitely kind of 
understands the game that's going on because he's kind of playing playing as a kind of conduit. Cuddy, I don't know as much, but it's this kind of instrumentalization instrumentalization of their relationships as a means to, uh, you know, probe or um, punish or um, flirt with the idea of Stacy as a person, like punish Stacy, or is it he loves Stacy, or is it something else? And the other thing that's really interesting about this episode is there's this parallel element within the entirety of the episode, which uses the five stages of grief. Now, the context of the plot, um, it serves the purpose of House lecturing to uh, Cameron about her inability to deal with the death of a patient who is, well, not the death, but the inevitable death of a patient. And so he go, talks about how there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And instead of the patient going through them because she's been denied that experience, Cameron's going through that experience on her behalf as a way to shield the patient. Um, which has a history because in season one, she has a problem talking about uh, grief or uh, informing uh, a patient about their condition. Yeah, Especially in maternity, when it's, it's when the baby dies. She's unable to tell the parents. Absolutely. Freezes up. Yeah, and so there's form for that. But what's really interesting is she becomes a proxy for that uh, five stages of grief. That's element one. The el- The second element which uses that is um, House is going through that same kind of process in trying to understand where he where the land lies between himself and Stacy um you know he's denying there's a problem he's then kind of angry about the whole issue but then he's bargaining for it then he's depressed and then he accepts it but that leads to the inevitable question of what does acceptance mean for house when it comes to Stacy accepting what and that's like perhaps the thesis of this part of the season is what does acceptance of Stacy entail? Does it mean she can work there or can't work there? Does it mean love? Does it mean hate or what? Yeah, like if he accepts... Yeah, I mean, if he accepts that actually Stacy was totally wrong, that acceptance might include, oh, well, she should definitely never see me again. She's awful. It's um, it's It's a very interesting way that the episode frames itself. And yeah, you're right, that... that that does have like greater effects on the season. It's um v- very interesting that the show like opens with like I think I I mean it's not particularly like covert, but like there is a really good like thematic exploration in here. Mm. Which um which the show does so well and I believe it starts to do more and more. We noted like you and I started noticing throughout season one that it started happening more and more. And I believe it's more common in season two. The fact that it opens, you know, with that. It's not like the the first episode of season one opened with this kind of like, here's the name of the episode. It's called Acceptance. We're going to explore that as a theme. Mm. You know, it's uh, season two is opening with that. And I think that's kind of putting its first foot forward in the kind of show that House is going to become. It's going to become, you remember the greatest episodes of season one? Well, that's what every episode of season two is going to try and be. Oh, and that's a tall order. It is, but um, but we'll see. I, I seem to, from what I've seen, it seems to pull it off. But we'll um, you know, hopefully see as it goes on. But um, I I think the acceptance theme. Now that we've discovered the theme of the episode, is probably the best way of of talking about it. Because the way I'd read it is that Chase Chase doesn't really have a lot to do in this episode. Um, so I I would say that primarily it's the House Stacy thing. Uh, it's House and Stacy dealing with their relationship to get to the acceptance point. It's Cameron dealing with her inability to tell a woman who every test is telling her that it's terminal cancer. And Cameron is unable to tell her because I think with her experience with House, there's always this idea that, oh, maybe it's something else. And it's just her constantly hitting her head against the wall, you know, trying to find a little gap where she can be like, oh, maybe just a slight moment of hope and then that gets trashed and it's just that over and over and over again 
And then also there's, uh, to a lesser degree, there's uh, Foreman, who he doesn't really follow that five stages theme that you laid out. Yeah. But um, we once again, in the same way that Foreman hated the homeless woman in season one, um, which I can't quite remember the name of the episode now, now that I say it. Oh, uh, in uh, season one, uh, Histories. Histories, that's it, yeah. Yeah, that 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 was kind of you know he he had a problem with this with this character, with this homeless woman, and his reasoning was that he felt that homeless people were lazy, and Foreman had worked his way out of an economic situation, and that therefore, you know, uh, people who fail to act and improve their lives, Foreman kind of hates that, and in the context of Foreman, it made sense, and kind of, it, it kind of shows that Foreman hasn't really learned his lesson massively because we're back in this situation where. Once again, we have someone on death row who's killed four people. Slightly different context because obviously someone that kills four people is probably less innocent overall than someone who's just homeless. <laughs> it would be ridiculous of me to properly equate those yeah. situations. But the the show is kind of, in a way, treading old ground. It's like, uh, but I like that it's consistent. I like that Foreman, like in the same way that Chase seems to hate fat people, like Foreman doesn't hate fat people, but he does definitely have a problem with people who come from his kind of background and don't improve their lives because Foreman's done it. And it's a very interesting consistency with Foreman. I like how consistent House is in that way. Like if someone who was overweight came in and Foreman hated them, I don't think it would work as well because Foreman doesn't really kind of, that's like a lifestyle choice that Foreman wouldn't really have a problem with. Foreman seems to have a problem with people not like bettering themselves and like you know escaping situations like this um this uh, death row inmate who came from a very similar situation as foreman he came from like a bit of unst an unstable home from like a poor background and has ended up in prison having killed four people and foreman is most certainly the most hostile uh, to him um we don't really ever know what house's thoughts are because house is so interested in the case that that's pretty much how once again, the whole thing is done. We don't really, we actually even get a moment where Foreman asks House if he believes in the death penalty. And House is just like, everyone has an opinion, but never expresses that opinion because that's not really important. We don't really care what House thinks about the patient. The point is that House, you know, will treat everyone equally because as long as they have an interesting mystery, that's what the important thing about House for now. Oh, I, Ooh. I have a, I, I, I think that's part of the, solution but not the whole thing go on um because it's not really it's 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 what's not said that's really important here because for foreman the journey is quite straightforward which is um you know the death row guy is going to die anyway why not just let him die it doesn't matter like if he dies from this or he dies from that it doesn't matter so why are we doing our job when we could be spending our time doing something much more useful, like yeah. uh, trying to solve a problem that Cameron has, which is the terminal, terminally ill patient. And she chimes in and says, well, why are we spending so much time on this this patient? And as you've said before, then, um, you know, why are we spending so much time on this patient when we should be pe spending time on mine, who actually has some sort of worth in society? Yeah. And... House never gives a straight answer, and I think the and she kind of challenges and says, "Oh, is it because you only like really interesting cases?" But he didn't say anything. He didn't answer that, and I think there's a reason for that because it's quite obvious why um, he's treating that person because he is ill, and it doesn't mean it doesn't matter if he's ill and then he gets better and then he dies. What matter What matters is that he has a duty of care to a patient that he is in his charge and that they must treat him oh you're giving quite an optimistic read to house's actions then i think in this case it is and it's only optimism but it's silent just because it's not spoken doesn't mean that isn't the case he's just i think the silence to me tells me everything i need to know he's not trying to crack the case although the case really interests him it's about just healing the person in this case and for house 
the other patients an open and shut case. They're dying. They need to prepare for death. Whereas for the the inmate, he's dying, but it's he, and he will die because he'll be on death row. But he has a chance to live, even if that's for a day. Because I mean, like the counter example is if you knew that someone was going to die in a week from get if you had the foreknowledge that he was going to get hit by a car and die anyway and you save his life today yeah um you can easily make the argument not to save the person's life because it doesn't really matter he's not going to be here for that long oh completely i i do think the foreman's argument about oh he's going to die anyway <clears throat> is very disingenuous foreman yeah. like clearly has a bit more baggage with this guy yeah uh, and th- that's what i like about the way that the characters in house um react to certain characters like they're not just hostile for no reason like it it, it, it's it's on purpose why foreman has a problem with this guy later in you know uh later in the series there's another fat character and surprise surprise the only person who has a problem with him is chase (laughs) it's uh (laughs) you know chase is yeah chase is by design you know i mean like yeah the, the characters are very carefully selected to hate certain people and it's um once again, like Cameron doesn't even necessarily um, hate the death row patient. She obviously has similar feelings that like that they sh- probably shouldn't be spending as much time on him because he's killed four people and he's going to die anyway. But once again, that's kind of done in a reaction because she actually wants this other woman to be helped. Mm. But even then, that kind of care doesn't necessarily come from like just pure like, oh, we should save this woman like Cameron really wants that woman to be helped a lot because Cameron's the one who has to deal with it. And that kind of blends into Cameron's like fear of um, being the bearer of bad news. Like Cameron hates that. Cameron hates having to confront people about that. So it's it, it uh, it's nice that everyone's not so simplistic. And I really like that the series has kept this up. Like it's not just Cameron's not just saying, oh, this woman works and she's better. It's really the real concern is that she has to tell us she's going to die. That's what she's trying to avoid. And Foreman's problem isn't, oh, this guy's a murderer. He shouldn't be helped. The real problem is that actually he's kind of reading into a lot of it with his childhood. And, you know, this guy kind of sees himself as Foreman. He's like, well, if I can do it, why can't this guy? And, um, yeah, I I like that the series has has kept that up and it makes everyone's motivations much more complex. And especially if you throw in the fact that your, like, house is silence on the matter you know, then it's like, mm. you know, what are house's motivations? Well, we never really know, but they're definitely more complex than just uh, he wants to solve the puzzle. Well, yeah, that's my whole point. Yeah, no, I'm agreeing with you. Sorry. No, I was, I was, I was no. repeating you because I was agreeing. I wasn't seizing it for myself. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to just elaborate on that point, which is that can involve no- noble intentions. He is known to act virtuously or morally mm. when the time calls for it. And sometimes we neglect to see that he, as much as he enjoys the intellectual challenge of being a doctor, he does actually enjoy being a doctor for, for the sake of the vocation, which is to heal people. Yeah. Um, he, he does give that very funny line where Cameron quotes the Hippoc- Hippocratic Oath and he says, yeah, but they don't make you sign it or anything, <laughs> <laughs> which I really like. But once again, I, I agree. I think actually House does believe in the Hippocratic Oath, but he it's that classic deflection because he's like, I don't even care about having this conversation. I'm just going to totally dismiss everything you say until you be quiet. <laughs> Well, I don't even think he... Well, we've had this discussion before. Mm. Uh, does he actually believe in the Hippocratic Oath? He even says himself that he doesn't. He yeah, will I... do harm to heal. Oh, uh, yeah, but I mean in the sense that, like, there, there's there's some over... Oh, yeah, he. I don't believe he believes in all of it, but there's some overlap. Like House, as we've said, like House has... House has beliefs. He does what he thinks is right. And I don't think that yes. the Hippocratic Oath is particularly controversial in the way it says, you know, everyone has, you know, should be treated in a certain way. Like, yes. I think House agrees with bits of it. Yes. Yeah. I but agree. um, But his morality is much more contingent on the situation, I think. Yes, totally. And I think that's, that's really where everything falls apart <laughs> with the character interactions. Uh, th- yeah. And the interesting thing also with Cameron is she's all 
kind of high and mighty and being moral, but really her central motivation for avoiding this sad and thank thankless task is because of the fact that she feels uncomfortable with it because it conjures up bad memories completely and um what what i love about this episode is that wilson is totally weaponized as well <laughs> <laughs> so the going back to that theme so the entire thing once again is um you know between the relationship with stacy and the relationship with um uh the, with and then the situation with cameron and um Foreman, once again, as we say, he's he comes to an acceptance after speaking to this guy, and eventually, um, the uh, the big uh, the big diagnosis they come to is that he has a tumor on his adrenal gland, which is releasing excess adrenaline, which um, they they basically discover because uh, some of like this guy has killed a lot of people, but some of those kills are inconsistent; they don't really have a motivation. And so they discover that this person actually has excess adrenaline, which is causing him to be super violent, which is causing like his heart rate to increase and all these other problems. And so um, what Foreman kind of forgives him and accepts him on is that actually, you know, on the face of it, yes, he failed to escape his situation, but actually maybe it was like a medical condition, which is the, the, the context that for some reason makes it fine with Foreman. Which I guess is a lot about Foreman. He's very much about accountability. <laughs> yeah. By the sounds of it. But um so Foreman doesn't really go through a process. Foreman just kind of has acceptance, but without the other stages. Which which is which is nice. I mean, if they couldn't think of a way to do it well, at least they had a bit of character growth for someone. But um Cameron and House are going through these kind of different emotions. The what is it? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And um but what's interesting is that Wilson is used in both of these circumstances to offer advice. And I really think this season starts to na nail down why Wilson is good. <laughs> yes. Because um, he's the only character who's external from the team who can like, but can still talk to the entire team and be sort of this like guiding, like sort of hand of consciousness, a uh, sort of conscience and like morality and good decision making, even though Wilson's not perfect. But he's clearly a very wise person. Whereas um, I don't think Cuddy can really do that. Like Cuddy has involvement, but Cuddy's much more concerned about the way the hospital runs. So she yeah. always argues for people to behave and do the right thing so that the hospital can run well. Whereas Wilson kind of tells people to do the right thing for like their own kind of goodwill, which is a very different approach. And I think the show is really starting to really put everyone in their place and utilize them well. So yes. um, Wil Wilson goes to, to house at one point. And uh, House is messing with Stacy, and Wilson basically tells her, hey, maybe you should be a bit more, you know, sort of um, subtle about this. Because, you know, you can mess with Stacy all you want, but if you put, turn her against you, you'll just have another person against you. And then on the same time, like, Wilson is the head of oncology. Cameron's patient has cancer, so Wilson's there, always on Cameron's back, saying, you know, you can do this test, but she's terminal. And they keep doing it, they keep doing it, and Wilson's kind of the guiding hand that pushes her down this road. And um, you see at the end why Wilson is so important for that storyline is because even when Cameron has the biopsy results, which ob ob objectively say that that woman is going to die in six months, Cameron is laughing with her in a room. And you kind of wonder, would Cameron ever tell her, would she just keep her in this hospital bed for six months Jesus until she went, Christ. oh, you're dead? <laughs> I mean, she wouldn't. Obviously, that would be absurd. But the very fact that, you know, Cameron is not thinking rationally, Cameron is you know, clearly needs Wilson in that situation. And uh, we also start to see a bit about Wilson as well. We see kind of how tough Wilson is, which we kind mm. of saw in the episode in maternity in the last season when he replaced Cameron to tell that couple that their baby had died. We know that Wilson has clearly been telling people that they've died for a long time. But the important thing that Wilson really tells Cameron to help her growth is, you know, Cameron just keeps saying, oh, you know, this person, I should be friends with her because something terrible has happened to her. And Wilson actually gives some very, very interesting advice. He's like, it's not worth it. And you kind of see a lot in that. You see that Wilson has been there and done that. And even though he can be very, sometimes very cold about needing to tell people the truth, you can tell that that comes from a place. Yeah. It's, um, and, and that's really the strength of Wilson is. I, I think they give him a bit more depth in this episode because they show that there's a lot of hurt to Wilson and that's kind of governing the way he is. 
but also yeah. they like utilize him for like narrative purposes and that he's kind of flicking between these storylines kind of giving people advice but he doesn't seem like just some kind of all-knowing like font of wisdom he's very much like he seems like a person who's just concerned about people and it's um so yeah i mean we've complained a lot about wilson i just wanted to express that i think wilson is very well used in this episode and i kind of got the sense that he was more of a person yeah and i understood why he was there also the way he counsels house when he's discussing stacy with him is much mm. more interesting and mature like wilson starts laughing whenever house st- at the just at the end of the scene when house is going through his whole neurotic thing with stacy and it seemed like a very good moment well yeah it seems like two friends talking yeah which is interesting. and you can kind of tell with the tones as well that wilson approaches both of them like him and house kind of there's a lot more metaphor there's a lot more joking there's a lot more he kind of goes down to house's level of of you know kind of making it a bit sillier but when he's talking to cameron who's a colleague he's much more straight he's much more like He's much more open and emotional, which is nice because he's not like that with House because he knows that that won't work. So he actually frames it to House like it's a sort of game theory. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't mess with Stacy because it will mess with your chance of getting what you want. And then maybe House will go away and then ingest that and turn that into an emotional lesson. But House has to do that himself because he can't do that in front of other people. He's totally incapable. of. Oh, it. yeah, definitely. As we've seen in the last episode, last season, totally incapable of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He always does these things in private, so it's uh, it's kind of funny the way you know they're they're really writing Wilson very well. He seems to like know everyone, and um, you know if you, if you even imagine those scenes flipped and him approaching either character in either way, like it wouldn't work. And I think that's that's why Wilson has gotten really right, and also why those scenes work and how the relationships between the characters is really developed yes uh we're we're yet to see the cuddy relationship become established as you say she's still the authority figure um but yeah she's a very charismatic authority figure but i agree with you there's not really that Uh, you've you've noted like there's definitely a history there but i agree with you we haven't seen not yet and that's the tantalizing part of all of this hoodie Oh, when will it happen? Season seven, please. I want to talk about Huddy. <laughs> um, she's also really kind of unsympathetic going, oh, you've got an imaginary pain to LL Cool J. I mean, Clarence. Yeah, when he's so, screaming in agony. It's, yeah, it's very interesting. It's like, oh, this is just a made up pain. Well, he's like sweating. Going, ah, <laughs> ah. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's got a necrotic bowel but but as you say like uh, that kind of but that kind of shows how into the hospital she is like she's not like her she is kind of the hospital personified that's her purpose yeah. and she's still got a character she's charismatic she runs the team in an interesting way but like but that's her whole thing her whole focus is the hospital and we haven't really let down that veil yet mm. and seen into her personal life but it's very funny because no other person would treat I mean, maybe Foreman would <laughs> treat the the you know the um the 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 patient that hostily, but Foreman would do it just because he doesn't like the guy. She has no she has no connection to this guy. She just is like, "You're taking up the hospital." I, I'm just I'm just gonna qu- tell the nurse to step outside for a while, where I watch you die. <laughs> That's <laughs> Foreman. <laughs> uh, Cuddy's just like, <laughs> "Oh, you're just making it up. You're you're wasting everyone's time." We could use this bed for someone else. Oh, you've got a necrotic bowel. I, I, you know, yes. Those are two fundamentally different management styles of a situation. And both of them, one <laughs> is an accomplished manager. The other is an aspiring manager. Very disturbing. I think it's another comment on um, uh, authority uh, from Mr. Shaw. Although it's not written by uh, David Shaw this time around. Uh, who is this one written by? Oh, uh, now you put me on the spot. Now I'm going to have to consult fandom. Oh, jeez. It's written by Russell Friend and Garrett Lerner. Okay. Interesting that David Shaw didn't write the season premiere. And I think, yeah, these are new. These are new writers as well. They're very good. 
They are very good. It's um, but I I guess that kind of makes sense because this like, I'd say the season two finale has David Shaw involved, and that feels like a very big deal. And so does the season three opener. But there's something that's not a big deal about season two episode one if you watch it not knowing that it's a season premiere um after like how big of a deal the season one ending was yeah it it doesn't really feel like a like a season opener which which is quite interesting i don't mean that in a bad way but if you could you stuck this episode halfway into the series you wouldn't really notice would you well i think you would because my personal well, without opinion. without all of the Stacy stuff. Well, yeah, well, strip that away. There's not much of an episode, right? Or are you talking about the case itself? Yeah, the case itself. Although you're very right, actually. Like without the Stacy thing, like the entire theme falls apart, and then it stops being a clever episode. Yeah, <laughs> stops being a well constructed episode at all. The also the interesting thing is that the secondary patient in this also takes a primary role in exploring the main theme much more explicitly than in uh season one and Mm. cameron is the person that's uh, attending to the uh secondary patient not house himself which is even more it's change it's game changing yeah well i think this is probably the most the most fleshed out clinic because she's the clinic storyline essentially yeah the b plot if nobody's listened to this the way that we usually break down the episodes is like the human storylines which is among the team and then the medical storyline, which is like the patient and the medicine involved with that. And then we have the clinic storyline, which is the clinic scenes, which usually appear. And um, yeah, the cli- I mean, the entire Cameron uh, section is a clinic scene because that woman comes in via the clinic. Absolutely. Because uh, Cameron is doing the clinic hours to make up for House's extra hours that he used to bargain to, to, get, the, uh, <laughs> to get the death row patient into the hospital. So it's... Um, it, it, it's quite funny as well, the method that House will like make ridiculous promises to Cuddy. And you're like, wow, House must really want this. And then he just fobs it off on camera. And you're like, oh, he just knew he could get away with it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that entire clinic scene is like a really big like moment for Cameron. Like this would be, I could totally imagine this, this tumor patient being like, like a main, a main patient. Um in some ways it is like the babies the entire baby storyline they were the main patient the babies and the parents and we kind of explored this theme and it's amazing now in season two it's using that entire storyline as like a secondary storyline spending like half the time on it and getting as much done it really shows how far the show's come yeah it's all kind of intertwined together Mm. uh quite nicely um so kudos to uh mr lerner and Mr. Friend. Absolutely. Do you, do you want to run through the um the the five stages of each uh, each storyline just so we can kind of create a narrative of that? Yeah, oh, interesting. I think that's probably the most cuz I mean, we've discussed Foreman, Foreman's angry and then he forgives the guy when he learns some information. <laughs> the patient is death row. We we kind of learned that, you know, that he 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 had an issue and that maybe was why he killed the characters and it kind of gives him a bit of complexity for a patient at least and then we have these these two main storylines the thematic storylines the yeah you know the the five stages of of grieving storylines yes yeah. yeah so of course you've got house at the be- very very beginning of the show in the same room with cuddy and stacy and house says yeah i'm i'm totally chill with stacy being around no problem whatsoever. That's not a problem. Nothing. <laughs> so that's denial. Okay, you do anger. Uh, anger is um, anger is a tough one. Oh, anger. Well, anger is when um, when Stacy messes him, uh, screws him over for the first time. Yeah. Then there's the bargaining, which is where um, House tries to come to an accord with Stacy. Um in order to establish a trust so that they can maintain keep the cat keep the patient in the hospital uh for as long as possible that collapses there is no more bargaining then there is depression 
And it's just literally House being a bit depressed. Yeah, it's him having a couple of drinks that he uh, with the half bottle that he's got left over from when he drank with the patient. Yeah, and then acceptance is basically the question mark at the end of this episode. What the hell does acceptance mean to House? What is he accepting? Mm. For, and what implications does that have for the next episode? Yeah, you're right. It's a very weird moment because we don't... It's not like acceptance comes... I mean, he's depressed in that moment and then he crosses off acceptance off the board where he clears it. Yeah. So it's kind of, you know, has has he accepted in that moment? Will he accept later? Is he dismissing acceptance? Is he accepting that he wants to be with Stacey? Is he accepting that he doesn't want to be with Stacey? As you said, it's, it's a very interesting way of leaving it. Um and then there's I do like that all of the stages aren't crossed off because that would be a bit like cheesy. I think if every time Cameron came back in the office, House was like, you're experiencing a new thing and crossed it off. Ah. Like if she told the patient that she was terminal and she walked in, he was like, you've told her that means acceptance. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Don't quite do that. He does it subtly. So throughout the entire episode, you see him cross something off. Yes, but he doesn't do depression and acceptance is what I mean. He only does three. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, it really triggers the completionist part of my brain. It's like, please cross them all off. <laughs> but but yeah, oh no. I, I t yeah, he, he does it at the start and that kind of sets the trend. But I like that it doesn't go all the way to the end because I think that would be very cheesy. But then and then there's Cameron. So go on, talk us through it. Do the five stages. Starting with denial. Go on, okay. guys. What's, what's the denial bit? Um, denial is just that, oh, you know, you're not, maybe you're not that sick. Let's have a look at this. <laughs> you know, let's do some more tests. Anger. <laughs> Anger, just getting really angry at House and saying, I'm over you. <laughs> Fuck you, House. I've got this all handled. Why do you give a shit about the, uh, <laughs> the inmate when you should be giving a shit about my patient? Better use of resources. Bargaining. Uh, that's uh, trying to bargain for the test with House and getting Wilson involved. And she's there trying to support him, her, uh, by conducting the first preliminary test and then a biopsy. Depression. And that's when she kind of confesses all to Wilson and says, look, uh, this is because of a really horrible time I had when I married my husband, who was terminally ill. And I wanted to make an impact. And it sucks that this is happening again. Acceptance. <laughs> this is really off-putting. Um, <laughs> acceptance. Well, just telling the telling the patient. And then she's going to go for that entire process. It's like a disease. <laughs> Spread across three vectors. House first, camera in second, patient third. It's very disturbing. Yeah. And what are the five stages for Foreman? Denial. He denies the man should have treatment. Life. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's basically it. That is pretty Denial. much the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that is the episode. We just wrap that up so easy. See? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I would say, like, yeah, aside from talking about how it starts and the production values are a bit better and you know, and, and the acceptance theme, um, fairly, fairly standard episode, which, which is unusual. I wasn't quite expecting that for a premiere, but still a very strong episode. I think if this had been in season one, we'd have praised it for its like thematic consistency, like the way it explores that theme and grows the characters. I think very good overall, very strong opener. This, this is about as good as like the best of season one. And, um, it's up there, yeah, I agree. So what's your what's your final differential diagnosis then on the show as a whole, on the season premiere? A solid, a very solid episode. Um, I think it uses the best techniques that had been, narrative techniques and plot techniques that had been cultivated in the first season and has applied them quite artfully to the, first se first episode of the second which is great um and it's a good way to start the season i think it opened up all these kind of questions for how things are going to proceed and that's a good thing because that's really what it needed to do 
was to kind of pose the big question, which was a house in either accepting or refusing to accept uh, the situation with him and Stacy, what is he going to do? Mm. And that's great. Such a simple, elegant question with a very artful plot and set of thematics that work towards that posing of the question. Great. Mm. Even has some... Uh, uh, hallelujah in there yeah of course you need a bit of hallelujah I'm glad it's got that out of the way <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I totally agree I think it's uh, it's it, it feels like a very solid episode that like just kind of gives you a taster it, it poses this question and and as you actually noticed really cleverly like not only is the the theme of acceptance the theme of the episode it also poses it as the theme and question of the season which uh just makes it a very just well written, tight, clever season opener, um, and I'm very interested. I really like the season, uh, the Stacey and House story. I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, and discuss it with you. Oh, always, always the best way to watch this uh, whole TV show is with moi. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's a that's a good arrogant uh, way to leave off. <laughs> so um well hey it, has, it hasn't been long it's been a, a a few weeks but um as always we we hope you had a good uh a good christmas good holiday good little season break and um if if some of you have decided to return to listen to this then that's fantastic and we can't wait to just carry on talking about season two and um as always, we, we, you know, if you could leave us a review on any platform you're using, that's great. We, we love to hear from you. So you can get in touch with us at, at House and Decast on Twitter or on our Facebook, which is just the name of the podcast. And, um, and yeah, just, just drop us a message. Tell us stuff, uh, like give us ideas for things you want to hear. We're, um, we're going to try and do more DD Extra episodes. We're going to try and do one each week, starting from the beginning. We'll see how far we go. Um, in the first episode of that, which is on uh, Saturday, we're going to start releasing them. We're uh, going to be talking about how SMD and The Good Doctor, like a short comparison from the few episodes of The Good Doctor we've watched, because it's another David Shaw show. So we kind of wanted to go into the differences, because I think me and Gaz have a pretty shared opinion on both of the shows. And um, mm -hmm. and people were recommending watching The Good Doctor, which we have done. And... Uh, we 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 don't feel as strongly about it as house but that's what's interesting because it's from the same person we want to talk about why they would have made slightly different shows um have i summed up that gas as a little mysterious taste of our opinions yeah that's fine that's a fine representation right there <laughs> unless you're like a mega fan now <laughs> you'll be like no dr sean murphy's my favorite well hey let's maybe we should <laughs> Just scrap differential diagnosis and do the good doctor. Yeah. It's three seasons. It's much more manageable. That's true. And only like 10 episodes a season. God, what are we oh, doing? Why are we wonderful. doing this one? Goddamn early 2000s TV, which is insistence on 24 episodes. It's a good system. <laughs> I wish they were just doing 10 high budget ones. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> but um, be yeah, as normal. Thank you very much for returning. There was sort of the, the garble of... Um, information we have to give at the end of each one to remind you to do basic things like listen to the next one if you want to <laughs> you could have made that decision yourself but it's uh as always it's goodbye from me yeah and ta from me see you guys later <laughs>